Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, this is the uh, Brook Byers Institute for Sustainable Systems ongoing seminar series. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, today we have Professor Anksha Menon. She's an assistant professor in the Woodruff School of Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, she's also a Brook Byers Institute for Sustainable Systems faculty fellow, and uh, perhaps most importantly, an alumnus of Georgia Tech. Uh, uh, she earned her PhD, MS and PhD, both here at, in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech, um, and earned her uh, BS degree from Texas A&M at Cutter, right. which I didn't know they had a campus in, in Texas. Texas is a big place, so I, I, I guess not. Um, uh, after she left Georgia Tech and before she came back to Georgia Tech, she spent time as a postdoc at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Her research uh, uh, focuses on technolo um, thermal technologies, um, excuse me, heat transfer technologies, especially those at the water and energy nexus. So, Professor Menon, take it away. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending in person as well as online. <clears throat> Hopefully my voice will will come through clearly. The problem is not helping, uh, but I will try my best. Uh, so today what I wanted to uh, share is some of the work that we're doing on decarbonizing water and energy systems. And when I talk about energy, I'm uh, usually talking about thermal energy or heat. Uh, so I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering, started the in this role uh, just this is my third year, uh, and I direct the Water Energy Research Lab. So we're primarily an experimental research group, and we have lab space in the Marcus Nanotechnology Building. And then, as Michael said, I was at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab before that, and at Georgia Tech as a student uh, myself. So the reason why. Uh, we work on technologies for decarbonizing water and energy systems. I'll walk you through sort of what our motivation is and what are some of the different projects uh, that we're working on. So everybody's probably heard of this water energy nexus, uh, which essentially means that we use water for energy uh, production. So, you know, traditionally that is for extracting fossil fuels, refining them, uh, producing you know, gasoline or natural gas. And then we also use a lot of water for cooling our thermoelectric power plants. And on the flip side, we use a lot of energy for water production, right? So whether we're extracting water, we're purifying it, treating it, uh, or we're distributing water, there's a lot of energy involved in all of those processes. So that's the energy for water component. And so that's really what we refer to as this nexus, where both water and energy are very coupled. And so we think about as we transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewables, maybe that water for energy will decrease significantly. But actually, if we look at what the clean energy um, future is going to be, we realize that the water demand is only going to go up. Okay? And the main reason is we're going to need a lot more um, water for mining different energy materials. Water is uh, used as a stripping solvent for a lot of carbon capture. Green hydrogen production is going to require fresh water for the electrolysis process. And even if we get away from our traditional thermoelectric uh, power plants, we're going to need water for geothermal, for concentrated solar, as well as for like biofuel production um, for the transportation sector. So clean energy future is actually going to exacerbate uh, water demand. Uh, so this coupling between energy and water will really just continue to be uh, very prevalent. So my group, what we do is we work on both the water and the energy side. So specifically uh, on the water side, we are looking at. Uh, we look at how we can use renewable energy to drive separations. Uh, so the main type of separation we focus on is desalination. Uh, and we use desalination either with solar thermal energy or with renewable electricity. Uh, we look at processes where we can really concentrate the brine that comes out from desalination. And we're also looking at how do we move from these very large scale centralized 
uh, desalination systems to distributed systems uh, that can produce or treat water co-located with end use. Uh, we combine both membrane and thermal separations uh, for producing fresh water, and we also do some techno-economic analysis to understand what, what that levelized cost of water is. On the energy side, we primarily work, like I said, on thermal energy or heat, uh, and mainly we're looking at applications uh, such as buildings where you need low temperature heat for space heating or hot water, so anything under 100 degrees Celsius. And then we're also interested in looking at high temperature heat, and that's mainly for industrial processes. So if you're trying to decarbonize uh, the heat or thermal energy requirement for cement production, steel, uh, that's where we can do high temperature thermal energy storage. We also have a couple of projects related to dehumidification and cooling. Um, how do we do this without traditional vapor compression technologies? Uh, and then I have a project with the Renewable Byproducts Institute where we're looking at how do we develop thermal insulation uh, using natural fibers like hemp and canal. Uh, and so on the energy side, we look at levelized cost of heat. Um, what is the amount or what is the cost associated with producing a kilowatt hour of heat? So today I'll just touch on like one project in each of these topic areas, but if anybody's interested in discussing the other ones, uh, I will be happy to talk through those. Uh, but what we really do is we operate at this intersection of thermal science and engineering and functional materials. Uh, so we work a lot with materials in order to really leverage those phase transitions or interesting uh, material properties for these applications. So we'll start on the energy side. Uh, so why do we focus on heat? Right, We've heard a lot about like electricity decarbonization, grid decarbonization. Why does heat matter? So obviously for some of you in the room, you know uh, why heat is important. But in general, if we look at global energy consumption, you see that heat is about 50% of uh, energy that's consumed. And most of that heat is either used in buildings uh, or for industrial processes. And where is that heat coming from? More than 90% of the heat is just by burning fossil fuels, right? So we're really only uh, decarbonized a very small fraction of our um, heat production. And so if we look at one specific use case, so buildings, uh, where is the heat really being used in buildings? And you see that it's primarily for space heating uh, as well as water heating. And these are the two largest uh, thermal loads in a building. Uh, and this is a US energy use so for a residential building. So what we're interested in doing is how can we given that 60% of building energy use is in the form of heat, and most of that heat is coming from fossil fuels, what can we really do to decarbonize uh, that heating load? So that's where we focus on developing thermal energy storage technologies. Uh, you can think of this as a thermal battery, so we would charge it and discharge it. Uh, but unlike regular like electrochemical batteries where there's only one flavor of electrons with heat you can have it at several different temperatures so depending on you know what temperature you really want uh, for your application uh, there are different types of thermal storage so the simplest one is sensible heat storage where you're just storing uh, the heat for example heat water from room temperature to 100 degrees celsius and you store that heat uh, the other option is to do a phase change uh, process, so just melting ice, uh, for example. And then the final option is a thermochemical reaction. So here you're storing and releasing heat uh, in a chemical reaction. So it's the heat associated with that reaction. We primarily focus on these thermochemical reactions uh, for thermal energy storage because in order to store about 10 gigajoules of heat, you can see that the volume associated with these different uh, technology options changes. And for a building, we really want something that's very compact because space is limited. And so that's why we work with uh, these thermochemical materials because they're 
have very high volumetric energy densities. So here's an example system. Uh, this is one of the projects that uh, I'm working on with uh, Professor Garamello's group. And we're looking at using these low temperature thermochemical materials in order to store and release heat for building applications. So we start with a salt that is hydrated and we charge it. So charging is when we supply heat to that salt and that causes the salt to dehydrate and release those uh, water molecules. And now you're left with this dehydrated salt. That chemical reaction is endothermic and so you're storing energy in the material. And then when we want to release uh, the heat from the material, we would supply that moisture back to the material or the water vapor back, and that discharging reaction is exothermic. So that's how you would extract the heat from this. So in theory, we want this very uh, reversible chemical reaction between a solid, the salt and gas, which is water vapor in this particular case. And the way we would use it in a real application is you would create a packed bed of uh, this salt material and you would charge it with uh, hot air during the day or when you know excess energy is available and then that is stored. And then later in the day when you need uh, the heat, you would uh, drive moist air through that and that would release uh, you would drive air through it and that would release the heat and you can use the heat depending on the temperature range for either space heating or for hot water. Uh, so this is the you know sort of material class we work with because it's for building applications so anything under 100 degrees Celsius these salt hydrates uh, work best. Our project is really focused on how can we integrate this thermal storage with a conventional vapor compression heat pump and that would allow us to boost the overall um, COP of uh, the heat pump. And that can be used for providing either load shavings or load shifting uh, to add uh, stability to the grid. When we actually work with these uh, materials, we realize that so heat and mass transport are occurring simultaneously, but there are a lot of irreversibilities with the reaction, and that's what causes uh, these batteries to actually degrade in performance over time. So an example of this is, again, in theory, we expect it to be a solid and a gas that are interacting uh, with each other. So if we have our solid, the water vapor would come in and just occupy the uh, like spaces within the crystal structure of the solid itself. Uh, so it would be a solid gas reaction. But in reality, we can have any kind of liquid formation. For example, your salt can get very wet. We call that deliquescence. And so you'll form a salt solution or your salt could melt. Uh, and again, you will form sort of this clump. Uh, and as you can imagine, you cannot really have moisture or vapor transport uh, through these agglomerated uh, states. The other thing we notice is that as we cycle, uh, these materials as we charge and discharge, even over just a few cycles, the microstructure changes quite a bit. So if we started with something that initially looked like a large um, particle, after a few cycles, we see that it really breaks down uh, into these smaller particles. So as a result of a lot of these material level uh, challenges, what happens is uh, this is literature data. We see that the cycling uh, behavior of these uh, salt hydrates decreases over time. So on the right axis in red, uh, I'm showing you the energy density that's normalized to the initial energy density. So 20 times as we hydrate and dehydrate, what happens is the energy density drops at the end of the 20th cycle to about 60% of what we initially started with. Right, so that's a pretty terrible battery if just in 20 cycles you're losing 60% uh, of your capacity. 
So we've been focused on really understanding what are the uh, mechanisms that cause this degradation in performance, and then what can we do to really stabilize uh, these salts. So there's really two challenges. One is uh, what we call hydrothermal instability, so associated with this deliquescence, so salt solution formation or melting. And the other is really structural changes in the material itself. So the particle size changing because as your uh, the salt is expanding to accommodate the moisture and then contracting again. So you have these mechanical stresses that build up over multiple cycles. Uh, so over the last year, we've really been focused on how do we uh, improve that stability. So we've done a number of different things. So we've looked at uh, optimizing the particle size itself. And we can borrow a lot uh, of information from you know, learnings in the electrochemical battery world and apply it to these systems. The so particle size is one of the uh, critical parameters. And so what we found is if you ball mill your starting material, if you just break it down into particles that are less than about 20 microns, uh, then you reach like a critical size after which the particle is stable. It does not break down into smaller and smaller pieces. And so that micron size uh, particle is really because that's where you can do, you can look at how the mechanical stress uh, changes within the particle. And then you see that if we come down to this size, that's where we would have a stable uh, size. So we pretty much ball mill all of our salts. And you also see that once you work with these smaller particle sizes, you can improve uh, the rate of your reaction. And that's because smaller particles have a larger surface area uh, to volume ratio. So you're able to get the moisture uh, in contact with a larger surface area, and that allows us to improve the overall um, reaction rate. We also see this is for the exact same material as what I showed you on the previous slide. Um, so this is strontium chloride. And once we ball mill the same strontium chloride to the smaller particle size and we cycle it 20 times uh, under the same conditions, you see that uh, the behavior is a lot more stable. So we don't see that same uh, drop in the energy density. So we're able to maintain the energy density within about like 95 percent of the initial value just by controlling uh, for this uh, particle size. Uh, some of the other things we've done is uh, different salts work under different conditions. And so we've also looked at salt mixtures where we combine two salts with very different hydrothermal behavior. So for example, magnesium chloride, uh, in these images here, you see that as we increase the relative humidity, the magnesium chloride just becomes a salt solution. So this is that deliquescence. It's very hygroscopic, so it just takes up a lot of moisture, becomes a salt solution. Whereas something like strontium chloride is very, very stable. It does not hydrate at 25 degrees Celsius until we get to uh, higher relative humidities. So the idea was if we combine a very deliquescent salt with a salt that has a very high hydrothermal stability, we may be able to extend uh, the operating range. And so we developed a 50-50 mixture by weight of these two salts. And as you can see uh, here in the red curve, at these conditions, the strontium chloride is really not hydrating. If it did, it would go up to 100%, but it's pretty much stopped at close to 40% uh, because this particular salt hydrates very slowly at these conditions. And then if we look at magnesium chloride in the cream, you see that it hydrates rapidly and goes above 100%. So in that case, it's actually just forming a liquid solution. And so that's where we would have those irreversibilities. Um, so by combining the two, we get the blue curve, and you see that we get up to about 100% um, 
not entirely 100%, but we're able to hydrate a mixture of the two salts at conditions in which either of them by themselves uh, would not perform well. So there is a lot we can do here in terms of uh, combining different uh, properties or phase behavior. Phase, uh, phase behaviors to really get better performance. And then finally, we also look at uh, developing composites. So how do we stabilize these salts by putting them into some kind of matrix? Uh, again, this is a lot that we can borrow from what's been done uh, for regular batteries. So we work with uh, materials like silica that are very um, mesoporous, so they have a lot of small pores. We can fill the salt in those pores, and then the salts are pretty much confined within the pores, so they're not able to leak out. Uh, so even if they deliquesce, they're physically held in place. And we have larger pores that allow for water vapor to diffuse in and out. So you're able uh, to keep the salts within the matrix and at the same time create sufficient pathways for the water vapor to transport in and out for your reaction to alcohol. Uh, we also look at using uh, polymers instead of silica. So a lot of polymers are very are vapor permeable. Uh, so for example, alginate will allow water vapor to go in and out, but it's hydrophobic, so it does not like liquid water. So we again, we can hold the salt in place within a matrix uh, in order to stabilize it for maximizing the cycling. So this is some of the work we're currently um, doing. So we're characterizing these materials and doing long-term cycling studies. Uh, beyond that particular class of materials, as I mentioned, we're also looking at a high temperature uh, thermochemical energy storage. So that is in this range of 400 to up to about 1500 degrees Celsius. So the idea is we would take uh, renewable electricity and use it to joule heat uh, these thermal storage materials to get to these high temperatures. And then we store the heat uh, within these materials. And then we can discharge uh, the heat, uh, usually using air as a heat transfer fluid to produce high temperature heat for a manufacturing process, or we can convert that heat into electricity using um, a traditional uh, heat engine, or at high temperatures, you can look at thermal photovoltaics. And then you can use that electricity for different applications. Uh, so across these applications, it's really looking at how do we uh, design these materials to minimize degradation. And so that is the focus of uh, two projects that uh, we have, uh, which this is in collaboration with uh, Matt McDowell's group at uh, Georgia Tech and ME and Claudio De Leo in aerospace engineering. And we're working with uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to really characterize uh, degradation mechanisms in high temperature uh, materials. And the goal is really to be able to develop these very reversible uh, batteries in order to meet two of these earth shot goals. So one is the industrial heat shot and the other is this long duration uh, storage shot. So shifting gears to uh, what we're doing on the water side. Could I, could I? Yeah. Is this a good time to yes. stop and ask any questions about this? Um, so yeah. Mike had presented last time, I think one last time, and it was interesting because uh, what he was presenting is how the cost um, of the material relative to the energy density. What was that? It was energy density and two dimensions you had, right, Micah? Uh, the, um, the, the cost of the lithium ion battery cells and then also the increase in energy density. So I'm wondering on that um, kind of cost curve that eventually comes down with the maturity of technology and then scaling, where is, or is this very early stage, so it's not, um, uh, are there prototypes of this that are working? There are, what is the cost? So there are prototypes of both low temperature as well as high temperature um, thermal storage. Most of them have been developed for, in Europe for like longer term or seasonal storage applications. 
where they will only cycle it a couple of times a year. Right? So they're storing all of their energy during the summer and then releasing it in the winter. Uh, so in those particular cases, the salts themselves are very low cost. If you choose something like calcium chloride or magnesium sulfate, these are like magnesium sulfate is just Epsom salt. Right, so nothing special there. Of course, if you work with a strontium salt, uh, that's going to be uh, pretty expensive. But the target that we have uh, is a dollar per kilowatt hour cost uh, for the material and for the storage system itself, because oftentimes this comes with a heat exchanger and other thermal components. Uh, so we're targeting costs around $10 per kilowatt hour, um, whereas Batteries are usually like an order of magnitude more. I see. Yeah, but it, again, we would never compete with a traditional electrochemical battery, which can charge just out very rapidly. Mm -hmm. You would never use heat uh, for a system like that. So this would be something that's like, say you're storing energy for eight hours, uh, for a couple of days, and then all the way up to that seasonal time scale. So again, not being a... Uh, expert in this area, what are the technologies you're competing with then in getting this to deployment for these longer term storage? So I think for like longer duration storage, flow batteries have been in the electrochemical world. A lot of people are working on flow batteries. Flow batteries. Yeah, so I think that would be uh, a comparable technology um, for this. And then for seasonal storage, you know, hydrogen is uh, one of the technologies, but of course it comes with its own uh, challenges. Thank you. And this really makes sense if your end product, if you want to use heat, right, which is, again, as I showed, 50% of that final energy consumption is using usually heat. So to store it as heat and use it as heat. Um, that's where there are advantages to thermal storage. Um, there are also groups that do like sensible heat storage with uh, just rocks. So what they call like dirt cheap because it is really just dirt and you can just store um, energy across large temperature differences in you know rocks and dirt as well all right so on the water side um, the reason why we're really looking at uh, desalination is because although it rains here so much we don't realize that uh, actually global water stress is uh, increasing and if we look at just by the end of the decade, our projections indicate that over half the global population will experience uh, severe water stress. So what we mean by severe water stress is that you're withdrawing more than 80% of the naturally occurring fresh water. And so you really need other sources uh, to augment your water supply. And if we look at where water stress is projected, it's not just that it's in specific regions of the world. Um, of course, in the more tropical climates um, and the desert regions, you're gonna experience extremely high water stress, uh, but we can see here in the US and across large parts uh, of India and China, as well as Australia, uh, there will be severe water stress uh, and so this is where like desalination is an interesting technology solution. So desalination essentially is where we're removing salt from the water. So it is a separations uh, process. Uh, the challenge with current desalination is that 99% of operating uh, desalination plants are driven by um, fossil fuels. And so the carbon footprint is about five kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter of water that's produced. And we produce 100 million cubic meters of water a day. Right? So that carbon footprint is on the gigaton uh, scale. The other challenge with desalination is that it produces this brine. Um, so this high salinity or very salty byproduct, uh, that's often a challenge uh, to dispose. So if you have a seawater desalination plant, they just dump the brine back into the ocean, uh, but that's obviously causing a lot of challenges. And then if you want desalination in inland locations, uh, there really are no good disposal options for the brine. So we're focused on how do we develop uh, technologies for brine concentration uh, in order to really treat the brine, and then also how do we eliminate this 
carbon footprint of desalination by using um, renewable energy. So when we think about uh, separations, uh, why is it an energy problem? So I don't approach this as a membrane person or anything of that sort, right? For me, a separation is just where you have some energy input that's being used to uh, separate a mixture into two components. So if we're trying to do desalination, we'll start with some salt water, um, let's say ocean water, and we would supply energy, we would produce some clean water, and then there would be this brine byproduct. And that's because we can never extract 100% of the fresh water out because the energy required just goes up so significantly. So often with like seawater desalination, we extract about 50% of the water, and then your brine is now twice as um, salty as what you started with. Instead of de doing desalination, we can also extract uh, water from, my from just air, right? So there's a lot of interest in looking at just extracting moisture from ambient air. Uh, this is referred to as atmospheric water harvesting. So you take ambient air at some relative humidity and you can use, let's say, a sorbent or a desiccant to really dry out the air. And then you regenerate the desiccant uh, to get your moisture and then you condense it to get liquid water. Uh, so again, in either case, you're starting with some mixture. You have clean water as one product and uh, a byproduct and you have to put in energy to run the separations process. So we can look at how much energy would be required to do any kind of uh, separation process, and it really just depends on the concentration of water in the mixture. So that's defined by this water activity. And so the energy required, and this is the absolute minimum energy you need to do uh, a separation, just depends on the water activity. So now we can compare how much energy it would take to just separate water from um, seawater, so that's desalination, or to extract the water from uh, ambient air. So this is this plot shows you the energy consumption, so kilowatt hours per cubic meter of water that you're producing as a function of the water activity or the concentration of water in the mixture. Most saline water uh, falls in this range uh, between about 0.75 to 1. So seawater has an activity of 0.97. Uh, whereas if we look at just atmospheric water harvesting, you're typically using some relative humidity and the median relative humidity across the globe is around 65% or an activity of 0.65. So what that tells us right away is that uh, water in air is at a much more dilute concentration than water in seawater. And we can look at the corresponding energy requirements. So if we're doing atmospheric water harvesting, we would need a minimum of 20 kilowatt hours of energy to produce one cubic meter of water. If instead we do desalination, we see that you need one kilowatt hour of energy to produce that same cubic meter of water. So with this very simple like thermodynamic analysis, uh, we can see that extracting uh, water from a saline source, so doing desalination, is energetically much more favorable than doing atmospheric uh, water harvesting. Uh, so we've done some techno-economic analysis as well on this to show that the costs associated with desalination can also be a lot lower than atmospheric water harvesting. And so what we're doing to tackle the brine problem, because I mentioned with desalination, you'll always have this byproduct. Uh, so what do you do with the byproduct? So we're developing uh, what's referred to as uh, a brine concentrator. So it would take the brine from a desalination process and then concentrate it as close as possible to saturation, so where the salts crystallize out. And so the way we do this is really a, a fairly simple process referred to as air gap uh, diffusion distillation. 
So it's two plates uh, that are held at two different temperatures. And because of that difference in temperatures, you will have a partial pressure difference between your fluid flowing in both the plates. And that's what's going to cause uh, mass transfer to occur. And so starting in the bottom here, we'd have our desalination uh, brine that comes in. It flows up through this channel. We call this our condenser. And we can add in some extra heat. And then we will flow it down. This heated solution will flow it down uh, the evaporator. The evaporator and condenser are separated by an air gap. And so the water vapor will move from the hotter surface, the evaporator, to the colder surface, the condenser. And it'll condense on that outer plate. And as it condenses, it releases the heat of condensation. And that heat is used to preheat uh, the fluid that's flowing inside the condenser. So we're doing heat recovery within the process. Uh, and we're producing uh, permeate, which is the, the distilled water uh, in this process. So it's really just a counter flow heat exchanger that we use in order to concentrate uh, the brine all the way up to, um, so starting with a salinity of seawater, concentrated all the way up to saturation uh, in this process. We work with plastic heat exchanger surfaces uh, because metal heat uh, heat transfer surfaces corrode under these um, high salinity conditions. Uh, so we've done a lot of uh, heat and mass transport modeling in order to design the optimal uh, you know, length and surface area associated with this air gap diffusion distillation system. And how do we really get uh, four different flow rates? How do we get to uh, high enough uh, temperatures? And how do we maximize heat recovery? So here, what you can see is the hot stream starts off at 90 degrees Celsius and cools down to about uh, 30 degrees Celsius. Our cold stream comes in at 25 degrees Celsius. And just from recovering the heat uh, through this latent heat recovery, it's able to get uh, to about 80 degrees Celsius. So most of the heat is just recovered internally in the process. You only need to add about 8% um, as external energy in this uh, system. The rest is recycled in the process. So we currently have a demonstration uh, of this that we're running uh, in the lab and showing that we can do this continuously as the salt continues to, to precipitate. Uh, we're also looking at other uh, phase separation. So instead of doing evaporation of water, which is very energy intensive, and that's why we do heat recovery, uh, instead of that, we can look at materials that can exhibit different types of phase behavior. Uh, so for example, we work with ionic liquids that are thermally responsive. So these particular materials have a chemistry that allows them, so they have a hydrophobic and a hydrophilic component. And so they exhibit this really interesting phase uh, behavior where at room temperature, it's a single uh, homogeneous mixture with water. And then as we heat it up, we go past this two phase boundary and we form uh, two distinct phases of water and ionic liquid. Uh, the water is less dense, so it floats on top of the ionic liquid uh, layer. And so we really use uh, this type of liquid-liquid phase separation uh, in a forward osmosis desalination process. Uh, we also are looking at using uh, these materials for dehumidification, uh, because once you separate them, you have two materials, each phase at two different activities. One phase can absorb moisture from the air, the other phase can uh, release moisture to the air. So you can do humidification uh, and dehumidification. And these uh, particular LCST materials, lower critical solution temperature behavior uh, materials are interesting because again, that phase separation energy is a fraction of what the enthalpy of vaporization is for water. So we can avoid evaporative transitions and do a liquid-liquid phase separation.
Uh, so with that, I just want to acknowledge my group, uh, my students that have been you know, working on these different projects and the funding associated with uh, this work. So most of what I talked about today was uh, funded by the NSF and the Department of Energy, but we have some other projects as well. Uh, so I just listed all of those different sponsors. Uh, so with that, thank you so much again for attending. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Good. Thank you. Are there any questions um, online? If you'd like to answer a question, uh, you can go ahead and, and uh, unmute or, or raise your hand and we'll be happy to get to you as well. And in, 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 in the room as well, any questions? I'm curious what work Novellis funded from your portfolio. Yes, I didn't present any of the Novellis work. Um, we're working with uh, Novellis on essentially like doing some heat exchanger modeling for them. So they have these aluminum alloys with higher recycled content and they want to understand what that does because those alloys have different thermal conductivities, different corrosion properties. And so they want to understand how that impacts the thermal performance if those alloys are put into a heat exchanger. Um, so we're developing a model uh, for them. So recycled aluminum does not have the same properties as uh, primary? Correct. Yes. I see. So it is, so it's not recycled aluminum, it's alum aluminum with a higher recycled con content of material. So they were, obviously we don't have the exact alloy composition uh, that they're working with. But they're mainly doing this for their sustainability goals. But right. want to understand what does that do to so the recycled content is other materials. Yes. Huh. Yeah. Like what kind of material? That we don't know. Ah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> okay. There's a question from Micah. Micah. Hi, yes. Uh, so when you talked about the cost targets that you were aiming for, you know, very inexpensive materials, but then the cost would be higher when you considered kind of the heat exchanger, for example. Um, mm -hmm. Have you considered, so you, you, you mentioned like the additional cost adding to the per kilowatt hour cost, the cost of energy capacity, essentially. Have you considered models by which you separate the cost of essentially that power capacity, right? Thinking of the heat exchanger in terms of its power capacity because it inherently doesn't have a energy capacity, just because that's, that's something that has been increasingly common in the evaluation of, let's say, redox flow batteries and power to X, you know, power to hydrogen technologies as a way to kind of figure out which costs matter the most? Is that is that something you're already doing in your levelized cost analysis? So the levelized cost of heat analysis that we've done is just comparing uh, different existing technologies. We haven't done uh, an analysis for our, our actual project itself, and that is one of the end of project goals. But we would look at what is the material contribution uh, to the cost, what is the heat exchanger component contribution to the cost, and that would just come down to what our final system design ends up being. But there are separate cost targets that are just for material um, versus for like system level. So we would be looking at both of those, but we don't have that yet. Okay, yeah, no, it's a, I was curious because in, in essentially this, the research on electrical energy storage, this has been a, an area where people have done systems level modeling to right. evaluate that. And it seems like you are in a similar enough technological space that you mm -hmm. could really leverage some of that work that's been done such that you don't have to reinvent the wheel there. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah we can definitely, you know, borrow a lot of what's been done with electrical energy storage. Yeah, I mean, with, of course, different applications and therefore yep. different, you know, cost targets. But OK, cool. Yeah, so there we would be calculating a levelized cost of storage. One of yeah. the key components in a levelized cost of storage um, calculation is the number of cycles. And so that's why we really need to be able to 
fix the reversibility associated with these materials, because if you cannot cycle it um, multiple times, then your level less cost of storage is just going to go up. So that's sort of uh, what we're focusing on by moving from these seasonal storage time scales to more daily um, storage time scales. Sure, yeah, because when uh, when at least in the work that I've done previously, when we looked at seasonal storage, you're not cycling that frequently. And so actually sometimes people are like, maybe if you only have to cycle once or twice a year, you can get away with poor cycle life as long as you have good calendar life. Like, have you evaluated the calendar life trade-off? I am not familiar with the calendar life. Like essentially like how long, it, if it just sits on a shelf, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you'll have some self-discharge, right? Some, or like, I'm using battery terminology, like some loss. Yeah. But like the idea that even just like a lithium ion battery that sits on a shelf, no cycling, will degrade over time. Like that, yeah. that's what I mean by like calendar life, regard, like irrespective of cycling, basically. Yeah, so one of the things that has been, or well, one main reason why thermochemical storage is used for seasonal applications is because, again, the energy is stored in the chemical reaction rather than yeah. by like heating a vessel. Right. So the self discharge associated with just that storage step is pretty minimal. And that's why people store it in Europe over those longer durations. Yeah. Uh, but as we look to do like more uh, regular cycling, we would have to evaluate uh, what that looks like. OK, cool. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. At one point you mentioned um, milling salt yes um improved its storage cycling durability i guess yes but, um can you repeat that cycle like if at the end of 20 cycles you remilled it again would that rejuvenate the so with once you mill it down to this critical size it's stable it no longer wants to break down into smaller particles. So that you is did like, for 20 cycles. So if you did that yes. for 200 cycles, it would it would stay stabilized at about 95% of its original. Yes, because so we ball mill and then we cycle. But if you did not do the ball mill and you started with larger particles and cycled it over, you know, 20 or 30 cycles, it would come down to a smaller particle size. But what we do is just upfront, we ball mill it down to this critical size, and then it, we can cycle it for hundreds of cycles, and it would be stable. Because that know, is. Do you know the, the reason? What, what's the physical or? Yeah, so there is. We have we have a model. Um, so it really comes down to what's causing it to break down in size is the fact that there are these stress concentrations. So you just have to compare the. Um, stress that's building up in the material with the actual like Young's modulus and the ultimate yield strength of the salt. So if you can use a very standard uh, like mechanical stress model in order to characterize this and those models predict that the critical particle size assuming that you have a nice spherical particle is about five microns. So once you get to five microns the yield strength of the material itself is it's able to withstand the stress concentrations. So that's really what allows us to do ball milling and get down to those critical uh, particle sizes. So beyond that, it's that's the size that it's happened at. Um, so it no longer breaks down. Is it is it difficult to mill to the it's not it's very easy very to mill easy. down. Yeah. yeah. Low cost. Oh, uh, I haven't looked at cost specifically, but I mean, we just use uh, like zirconia beads and um, aluminum milling jars in order to mill these down. And then you can just use different uh, particle size meshes in order to make sure that you have a uniform distribution. It's basically so, a rock tumbler, right? Yeah, that's that's actually exactly all it is. Yeah. 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 But just with a really hard material that allows this to break it's down. It's just amazing that something so simple creates a, a very different property. Yeah. 
And the milled material has the same thermal capacity as the non? Yes. Yeah, it's really doesn't change anything about the chemistry or the phase behavior of the material. It's just changing the particle size. Is there any way to use the brine as the medium in which you store? Brine is a universal waste product, right? Nobody's found a useful. Well, a lot of people are looking at like yeah. extracting critical materials from brine, but again, you deal you're fighting thermodynamics, right? Because the concentrations are pretty low. So the energy you need and the cost associated with that extraction can be significant. You're doing some uh, um, we're, concentrating. Yes. So what we're doing is we're trying to we're so we're concentrating the brine. Uh, so instead of recovering only 50% of the water, we want to recover 95% of the water. So you're left with really the slurry at the end. But you're trying to optimize for recovery of water. What if okay. you tried to optimize for recovery of brine? If there was a product of the brine that you want? So you can, uh, but I think that's like very much early stages because there is no uniform composition for brine. So if the brine was from a particular source, it would be rich in a specific mineral. Uh, so for example, like geothermal brines um, or salt in sea in California has a higher lithium content. So everybody's looking at doing lithium extraction from that brine. Uh, but if we look at a brine over here or just regular ocean water um, desalination, it's just very heavy in sodium chloride and some sulfates, right? So you could do, you can produce um, commodity salts uh, from the guns, but some of these more exotic things like lithium or selenium extraction, I think we have a lot of like uphill challenges. Sea salt producers. Yeah, so sea salt, like a calcium sulfate, all of that we can extract pretty easily. Uh, because those are in a very high concentration. What kind of salts do they use in these molten salt things that people build? Like the concentrated solar application? Yeah. Yeah, so those are typically chloride salts. Yeah. Um, so some of those, yes, you can extract from brine. It's the... Naive question, I don't know. No, it's fine. It's, I mean, there's a lot of interest in extracting minerals from brine. I just, I'm not convinced that it would make economic sense. So we'd rather focus on extracting as much water as possible. Very good, are there any other questions online or, or otherwise? Three of you seem very, very quiet. Like yeah. they've seen the, the they've first task. Seen it all. They did all the work. For they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank and uh, thank you all for joining us online as well. Uh, we hope to see you in person uh, very soon. I think we have two more um seminars in the series uh before we close out for the spring so uh two weeks from today in april and four weeks from today in april thank you all we'll see you soon thanks everyone